Well, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to speak with you here this morning and uh, thank all of you for coming out on this morning. Um, I, this book came out uh, a year ago, and a year ago this month, and it was the result of really uh, an idea that I had or a, uh, what occurred to me, a need where I believe the, the fundamental cause of the climate crisis is industrialized humans' disconnection from the planet. And I decided I would try to write a book to try to bring people to see in writing, to see these places and hopefully feel them where the climate, well, the climate crisis is affecting every square inch of the planet now, but places where it is the most obvious and egregious. And I went out into the field in places like the Amazon and the Great Barrier Reef and glaciers in Alaska and glaciers in Glacier National Park and uh, national forests with USGS scientists to see what's happening to all of those different places as a result of the climate crisis. And tried to do my best to write about it in as articulate and personal and emotional way as, as I could to try to really bring the situation home to people. Um, because even here at a conference like this where uh, most people are acutely aware of the climate crisis, here we are in this room with um, false light and pumped in air, and it's easy, therefore, to feel disconnected from what's happening out there in the broader world. And especially right now, we can see the news about what's happening in Australia and see really upsetting footage of what's happening to wildlife there, uh, as well as humans. And, but even that can still feel kind of far away or over there. And I just want to talk to you today uh, about this in a, in a way that I hope brings it a little bit closer. Um, as Stephen just said, here we are at a, a health conference, and uh, it's been duly noted that the climate crisis is and will continue to be increasingly so the single biggest threat to human health ever. Uh, it affects everything, uh, all of our food, all of our water, uh, the places we live, how we're going to travel, how we're going to do everything uh, from, from this moment on is going to become increasingly affected by it. Um, I. You know, being at a health conference, I, I, I spoke at a, a nurse's conference up in Vancouver not too long ago, and I looked up the definition of the verb nurse, and part of it said to give medical and other attention to. And so at a health conference where we're trying to pay particular attention to our bodies and to how they're affected by uh, whatever your primary concern is, um, it seems like paying attention to this crisis and to how it affects us is, is paramount. Um, I included a quote in my book from a Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he reminded us of the value of just in being present with what's happening to the planet. He said, quote, when your beloved is suffering, you need to recognize her suffering, anxiety, and worries. And just by doing that, you already offer some relief. And I think all of us have experienced that whenever we've been sick and having just a friend or a loved one um, either sit with us or just acknowledge our, our pain and our suffering. It helps, it lightens the load a little bit. And, and I believe that that's possible even, even to the greater planet right now. So in the book, I, I, as I said, I went to a lot of different places and I want to take you to just one of those places now to give you a, a taste of, of what's happening out there. Um, a lot of these places were intentionally chosen because they were pl places that most of us have never been or would never get a chance to go to. And some of them I got a chance to go just because of this book. And it seemed fitting, given the theme of this conference, to talk about what's happening in the Amazon, as well as what's happened there last summer with the uh, really horrendous wildfire situation, as well as to bring that up because, as I'm sure this audience is attuned, so much of our uh, um, 
antibiotics and medicines come from the Amazon. So brief overview of the Amazon. It's two-thirds the size of the, United, the contiguous United States. It's the largest rainforest on the planet. It generates half its own rainfall and contains 20% of the world's rivers. The Amazon River alone has 1,100 tributaries, 17 of those longer than 1,000 miles. There's thousands of species of trees, 2.5 million species of insects, thousands of species of birds, and 3,000 species of fish in the Rio Negro alone. Um, there was a expedition there of roughly 25 scientists that went out to a very, very remote portion of the rainforest, and they spent 25 days there. Thanks. And in that 25 days alone, they discovered 80 species and counting. So that gives you an idea of how biodiverse that region is and how rich it is with life, and as well as how little we still know about it. So the primary purpose of my trip there was to uh, go to a study camp with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. Many people here have probably heard of him. He's, some people refer to him as the godfather of biodiversity. He started studying the Amazon in 1965 and has been studying it ever since. He's literally dedicated his entire professional life to studying and trying to take care of the rainforest. He was head of the World Wildlife Fund for 14 years. He's been a White House Science Council uh, and uh, has, uh, as I said, completely dedicated his life to uh, trying to conserve as much of the rainforest as possible. So I was along with a, a small international group of people who had been invited to spend time with him in Camp 41, which is the, the most famous of his study camps that he set up a long time ago. And so we showed up in Manaus, the biggest uh, city in that part of the rainforest, and from there took a rather long Jeep ride into the, the jungle, uh, long winding around very steep, sometimes curvy, bumpy clay roads, and, and um, got out at the uh, edge of the rainforest in this one area nearby the camp and walked down a small like quarter mile trail to Camp 41 where Dr. Lovejoy had already beaten us there and um, here's this esteemed scientist who literally took the time to run down there and welcome each one of us by name shaking our hand into his camp and thanking us for taking the time out of our busy schedules to, to go there and be with him. And um, the camp was situated where it's this small clearing uh, in the middle of the rainforest, and uh, there's no walls anywhere. Uh, over on the, you walk into the clearing, and over on the right side, there's a tin roof, and underneath it, there are poles with hammocks slung between them with mosquito covers. So that's that's the the sleeping area. And then straight ahead, there's another tin roof under which are a couple of picnic tables, and that's the kitchen in the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, really basically the lounge area for everyone. And then over on the left, there's another tin roof and uh, more hammocks, and that's for the scientists. So that's basically the camp. Pretty primitive, but you are in the rainforest when you're there. And immediately I started to note very profound changes in my perceptions and in my dreams. And so, Things like even the first night, just waking up with very, very stirring dreams, some of them profound, some of them very uh, unsettling. But I, that coupled with just the sounds of the insects, of the howler monkeys in, at first light, of the birds that literally feeling the rainforest kind of coming up into my being and, and pulling me deeper down into it is the best way I could describe it. And that only increased the longer that I stayed there. So one of the scientists that I spoke there was a longtime student of Dr. Lovejoy's, a man named Vitek Jirnek uh, from the Czech Republic. And he had worked in 11 different wildlife research positions around the world. And when I spoke with him at Camp 41, he was working on getting his PhD in ornithology from Louisiana State University. 
and was also a student of Tom's. And I'd just like to read you a brief passage from my interaction with him that really moved me. We talked at length about his work around the world, um, uh, VTech's work, and he was very, very enthusiastic about talking about the things that he'd studied and the places he'd gotten to go do research. But he assumed a somber tone when we started talking about the results of his research. Quote, island biogeography is no longer an offshore enterprise. It has come to the mainland. It's everywhere. The problem of animal and plant populations left marooned within various fragments under circumstances that are untenable for the long term has begun showing up all over the land surface of the planet. The familiar questions recur. How many mountain gorillas inhabit the forested slopes of the Virunga volcanoes along the shared borders of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, and Rwanda? How many tigers live in the Sariska Tiger Reserve of northwestern India? How many are left? How long can they survive? Then there was anger in his voice. How many grizzly bears occupy the North Cascades ecosystem, a discrete patch of mountain forest along the northern border of the state of Washington? Not enough. How many European brown bears are there in Italy's Abruzzo National Park? Not enough. How many Florida panthers in Big Cypress Swamp? Not enough. How many Asiatic lions in the forest of Gur? Not enough. How many injury in the Alamazotra? Not enough, and so on. The world is broken into pieces now. The, the whole mood of the trip was uh, kind of a roller coaster from amazement of getting to be and see and feel the Amazon and learning how incredibly rich of a place it is from a biodiversity perspective and, and just being wowed every minute by birds and animals and insects and other amazing pieces of information the scientists shared with, with me and then followed by big plummets of reality checks of things like what VTech had said to me and other scientists. And it, it really, uh, it, in fact, I could say that for my whole experience going around the world working on this book, but it was extremely pronounced when I was in the Amazon. Another, uh, I wanna read a little bit from an interaction I had with another scientist there, a, a long-term colleague of Dr. Lovejoy's. And she's a Brazilian scientist and I like to tell this joke when I talk about the Amazon. Of all the scientists, and there were a whole bunch of them that I interviewed for this book, she definitely wins the blue ribbon for having the best name. Her name's Dr. Rita Mesquita. And she's a biologist and researcher with the largest research institute in the Amazon. And I met with her in Manaus and would like to read a little bit about that um, interaction. Um, we were talk, we were, there's a forest fragment in the middle of Manaus, which is a very large city of well over a million people. And we were, she took several of us on a little nature tour through the forest fragment and was very excited talking about different things, different animals, di different insects, different plants. And um, occasionally one of us would ask her, well, you know, what can you tell us about this plant, for example? And she'd say like, oh, well, I... I really don't know that much about it, but, and she'd go on to list like the name, the genus, you know, the species, just everything. She was literally a walking encyclopedia and extremely passionate about what she did and, and loved her work. And again, like Lovejoy was because she, she cared about the, the rainforest so much and had literally devoted her entire life to studying it. Um, and this is pre-Bolsonaro in Brazil, so things were already very, very bad, but of course now, you know, keep in mind while I share more of this information that this is before the wildfires in the Amazon last summer and before Bolsonaro came into power. So Mesquita sees the world questioning conservation now and jeopardizing all the victories that have been achieved in setting aside land up until now. I work hard for conservation, she told me, but I lose sleep over wondering if I'm wasting my life. Am I wasting my life? Is this a lost cause? I keep doing it because it's the only thing I know to do. 
She says that she does not believe she and her colleagues are doing their jobs with the urgency needed. What, we are not telling the general public what is really going on, she said. Having co-edited a book with Lovejoy and authored many peer-reviewed scientific papers, Mosquita is a force to be reckoned with, but she personally feels inadequate when looking at the bigger picture. It is clear to her that we are nowhere near where we need to be. I have zero pride in all my papers because we are preaching to the converted, she says. What I want to do is talk to the outside world. I want to be able to just talk to people and tell them what is actually happening. We need to educate people about what is really going on with climate disruption. Like so many of the experts I'd spoken with for my book, Mosquito believes the root cause of climate disruption is humanity's lack of connection to the planet. Even here in Manaus, kids don't understand that they live in the Amazon, she told me. So there is no connection at all with anything, and that is the problem. There is sadness in her voice when she tells me this. I made a personal decision to not have kids because I don't have a future to offer them. I don't think we are going to win this battle. I think we are really done. The Tropical rainforests around the planet are already so degraded that, uh, in the Amazon specifically, that instead of absorbing emissions, they are now releasing more carbon, it is now releasing more carbon annually than all the traffic in the United States. In 2010, the Amazon drought alone released as much CO2 as the total annual emissions of Russia and China combined. We're losing 1.5 acres of rainforest every second. At some point in the not so distant future, the Amazon will regularly emit more carbon than it absorbs, yet another critical tipping point for Earth. And I'd like to close out talking about the Amazon by reading uh, a, a, a part of one of my interactions with Dr. Lovejoy that is very pertinent for this conference. There are reasons other than moral concerns for protecting the Amazon, including our own self-interest. Quote, we go to the doctor and the pharmacy and we have no clue where our drugs came from, Lovejoy told me. More than that is from nature than we realize. He mentions a poison found in the Amazon that led to the production of the pharmaceutical captopril, which in turn became one of the first ACE inhibitors and is now used by hundreds of millions of people to control their blood pressure and heart conditions. Captopril widens blood vessels, making it easier for the heart to pump blood through them. Most of the people taking it have no idea that this drug responsible for their health is from the Amazon. He mentions another example, a vine found by indigenous people that when they threw it in a lake, all the fish came up to the surface gasping for air, which made their fishing much easier. The name of the substance that causes this is curare. It is used today as a muscle relaxant during ma major abdominal surgeries. His point is that if we continue to destroy the Amazon at our current pace, we may never know how it could help save millions or possibly billions of human lives in the future. Lovejoy believes that this is one of the least appreciated aspects of biodiversity. Quote, the Amazon is a gigantic library of the life sciences, which is continually acquiring new volumes, he says. We are discovering new species of birds all the time. And wrapped up in all of that is incredible adaptation capacity. It's important to remember each species represents a set of solutions to a set of biological problems. And any one of those can turn out to revolutionize how we understand biological science. Lovejoy pauses and gazes admiringly at the jungle surrounding the camp where we sit, then turns back to me. We are so stuck on ourselves. We don't think we need any of it, he says. We think we are some godlike thing. I want to just share some broad brushstrokes now of what's happened on the planet just since this book came out in January a year ago. Um, I gathered together some information uh, for 
uh, the epilogue that I wrote for when this book is released in paperback in a couple of months from now, a few months from now. And um, this is far from a definitive or far from a uh, in fully inclusive list of major events or scientific studies that have come out just in the last year. But it gives you, this will give you an idea of how quickly things are progressing on the climate front. Um, just one week after my book was published, a team of glaciologists from UC Irvine in California and Utrecht University showed that over the course of four decades, the total mass loss of ice from Antarctica had accelerated at a pace six times faster than it had during just the 1980s. By July of 2019, scientists were trying to determine if glacial melting there would become irreversible. Think about that. Irreversible melting in Antarctica. They're questioning if that's, uh, if that's already a possibility, if it's already in motion. Later in 2019, researchers in Greenland told the BBC they were, quote, astounded by the rate of acceleration in the melting and express fear for coastal cities in the future. One of the scientists said, quote, so we're losing Greenland. It's really a question of how fast. And said Greenland is already facing a melting, quote, death sentence. The loss of the Greenland ice sheet alone will raise global sea levels 20 feet. Another study warned that if current warming trends continue, and there is no reason to think that they will do anything other than continue to accelerate. The mighty Himalayas could lose most of their glaciers by 2100 as they warm up by eight degrees Fahrenheit. This will bring radical disruptions of food and water supplies for upwards of 1.5 billion people, in addition to a refugee crisis of staggering proportions. As winter gave way to spring across the Northern Hemisphere, it emerged that 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded, with the only warmer years being 2015, 2016, and 2017. This year is on track, granted I wrote this in December, uh, as in one month ago. 2019 is on track to become the next fourth warmest year on record. That is another way of saying that the last five years are the hottest five years since record keeping began. So it didn't tie for the fourth warmest year on record. It, it, it became the second warmest year on record. And that means the last six years are the six hottest years ever recorded. At the same time, the UK's Met Office announced that we are living in uh, what will likely become the warmest decade ever recorded. And then since I wrote that uh, a month ago, uh, the 2010 decade uh, was absolutely the warmest decade ever recorded. The global food supply is already under severe threat from an ongoing and catastrophic loss of biodiversity, just as Lovejoy was warning. Around the world, the library of life that has evolved over billions of years, our biodiversity, is being destroyed, poisoned, polluted, invaded, fragmented, plundered, drained, and burned at a rate not seen in human history. Ireland's president, Michael Higgins, said at a biodiversity conference in Dublin, quote, if we were coal miners, we'd be up to our wastes in dead canaries, end quote. Climate disruption fueled extreme weather patterns are also adding to the risk of a global food crisis, as research revealed how multiple bread baskets could fail at the same time. An analysis published in the scientific journal Biological Conservation reports that plummeting insect numbers globally could lead to the collapse of nature, quite literally. Quote, our work reveals dramatic rates of decline that may lead to the extinction of 40% of the world's insect species over the next few decades, end quote, reads the abstract of the study. It warns that insects could vanish within a century and the researchers remind us that insects are, quote, essential for the proper functioning of all ecosystems and that the current trends are disrupting to varying degree the invaluable pollination, natural pest control, food resources, nutrient recycling, and decomposition services that many insects provide. To put it simply, when the insects are gone, so will be humans. 
And right now we are on a trajectory to lose most of the insects on Earth within 100 years. The Amazon rainforest, as I mentioned, burned last summer at a record pace, seeing an 80% increase in wildfires compared to the same period the previous year. Smoke from the burning forest darkened the sky over Sao Paulo, more than 1,700 miles from the fires, which were so large their smoke also covered parts of Bolivia, Peru, and Paraguay. Dr. Lovejoy, whom I mentioned, warned in an editorial in the journal Science Advances uh, while the fires were burning, quote, we believe that negative synergies between deforestation, climate change, and widespread use of fire indicate a tipping point for the Amazon system to flip to non-forest ecosystems in eastern, southern, and central Amazonia at 20 to 25 percent deforestation, end quote. The World Wildlife Fund, which Lovejoy used to head, estimates that 17% of the Amazon has been lost in the last five decades. And that statistic came before last summer's fires. The fires of last summer have brought us that much closer to the tipping point he warned us of. In fact, we could have already passed it last summer. Meanwhile, things went from bad to worse for the Great Barrier Reef. Not only is the reef subjected to ongoing bleaching events happening at a pace far beyond the natural rate at which they occur, but climate crisis-fueled rain events caused the reef to experience smothering of its coral when floodwaters drained onto it, bringing soil runoff with them. Some of the scientists referred to this as the nail in the coffin for the existence of the largest coral reef on the planet, which then received another nail from the Australian government shortly after that when it decided to give the green light to dumping one million tons of sludge across the reef. Less than six weeks after that, a study was published showing that the reef had suffered an 89% collapse in new coral after its bleaching events of 2016 and 17. This means that as the reef dies, it is unable to come back to life as the waters in which it live continues to warm, sedimentfilled rainoff, rainfall runoff covers it, and assaults from the Australian government continue. Meanwhile, in December, a study showing how the planet's oceans are rapidly deoxygenating, with some areas in the tropics having already lost 40 to 50 percent of their oxygen. To make matters worse, a landmark report showed that no matter how much emissions are cut, extreme sea level events that used to occur once per century will happen every single year by 2050. A previous study had already warned that unless dramatic emission cuts were made and coastal defenses against sea level rise dramatically strengthened, coastal lands that currently house 300 million people will flood at least once every year by 2050. An Oxfam report published last month showed that already one person every two seconds is being forced from their homes due to the climate crisis. My concerns about what was happening in the Arctic regarding the increased release of methane have been proven out as earlier spring rains this past year uh, there have been thawing the permafrost at an accelerated rate, hence releasing more methane than ever. In fact, permacross Permafrost across the Canadian Arctic is now thawing out 70 years faster than had been earlier estimated, according to Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky, who I'd also interviewed for my book. Another historic event occurred in 2019, this one in the form of the country of Iceland holding a funeral for the first glacier the country lost to the climate crisis. A plaque left on the location of the vanished glacier offers a letter to the future with the message, this monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it, end quote. Humans are now currently injecting CO2 into the atmosphere at a rate nine to 10 times higher than that during the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, PETM, global warming event 56 million years ago which acidified the oceans and drove large numbers of marine species to extinction. Quote, the fact that we could reach warming equivalent to the PETM very quickly within the next few hundred years is terrifying, 
Larissa DeSantis, a paleontologist with Vanderbilt University, said of the study, while geophysicist Gabriel Brown with the University of Utah observed, we don't have much in the way of geologic examples to draw from in understanding how the world responds to that kind of perturbation. Three months after that study was published, for the first time in human history, Earth's atmospheric concentration of CO2 reached 415 parts per million. Less than two weeks after that, the International Energy Agency announced that global carbon emissions set a record in 2018, increasing nearly 2% over the previous year to set a record of 33.1 billion tons. By November, the UN's World Meteorological Organization reported that the concentration of climate heating greenhouse gases had hit another all-time high and announced there was, quote, no sign of a slowdown, let alone a decline, end quote. Also, last year, the Trump administration began the formal withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement, and New York State's claim that ExxonMobil had misled investors for years about the risks of climate disruption was rejected in court. All of this in just 2019 alone, and this is far from a complete catalog of the unraveling of the biosphere. So I was forced, that kind of information is what this book kept bringing up over and over and over from all these different places on the planet. And by the time I got to the conclusion, I literally had no idea how to end the book. It was impossible to try to, you know, end on a positive note. And it felt a lot more honest. And, and I personally had to go inside and find new meaning and new reason to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I was struggling with depression and uh, much the same way that so many clients, climate sci scientists are, that there have been several very good articles come out about that. Uh, and this is why increasing numbers of colleges like University of Washington and Seattle up nearby where I live are starting to teach uh, climate grief classes and have curricula, increasing curricula addressing that. But um, so for the conclusion of my book, I, I basically had to start uh, waxing philosophical and finding new ways of being on the planet. And so I did my best to share that with, with readers. And I want to share a little bit of that with you today. And um, one person that I came across that has helped me a lot in processing this information as well as figuring out how to be during this time uh, was Stephen Jenkinson. He's a Canadian author and storyteller and has uh, worked in the palliative care industry for decades, during which he was confronted with the Western medical system's denial of death and refusal to really do endings, uh, which of course, you know, is, is an integral part of life. So he was giving a talk at Simon Fraser University in Canada a little ways back. And he was talking about the climate crisis and I just wanna share a little bit of what he said. The question is not, are we going to fail? The question is, how? The question is, what shall be the manner of our inability to care for what was entrusted to us? The question is, our manner of failing. <coughs> Jenkinson, who now makes his living by teaching about grief and the acceptance of death as an integral part of living, has spoken eloquently about grief and climate disruption. And so when he talks about our future to care for what was entrusted to us, he is also saying that the time to change our ways is long past. Quote, grief requires us to know the time that we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are willing to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful and hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. 
So we're, we're at a point now on the planet when we really understand the gravity of the climate crisis and other converging crises, our domestic political crisis, for example, um, the deforestation crisis, the, you know, the pollution of our own food supplies crisis, the use of pesticides, all of these things coming together. Um, it, we really are literally in an existential crisis. And, and so the feasibility of humans not making it through this is getting talked about uh, in an increasing way in different circles. It's, it's, it's becoming possible and a lot of people believe uh, likely. Uh, and so it really puts us right up against these questions that Stephen Jenkinson has talked about and writes about and, and other people that I include in the conclusion of my book. And it really gets us down to a point of where do we find meaning in this and, and kind of where do we go from here, knowing how overwhelming all of this information is and how do we do, deal with it personally. Um, and that's why I chose the subtitle of my book of Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning. How do we find meaning? I've had to really dig deep in order to try to find meaning in this. And so another thing that happened to me uh, when I was writing the book was a dear friend of mine, uh, Dwayne French, uh, a quadriplegic man, had come down with a very, very bad case of pneumonia. And anybody who has uh, ex experience with uh, people with quadriplegia knows any kind of respiratory ailment of any kind is a, a, a really big deal. Um, oftentimes, uh, as in the case with my friend, his, his ability to cough is extremely limited and um, you know, not being able to use most of his body, uh, it made it very, very hard for him to grapple with having pneumonia. And so after just half a week, he was in the ICU, and uh, I spent three weeks there with him, not knowing if he was gonna make it through or not, along with his partner and one of his other close friends. And we took turns sitting at his bedside, and it progressed, and the more time went by without his pneumonia improving, the worse things were getting, and increasingly the odds looked bleaker and bleaker as it just settled deeper into his system. And it really looked like that was gonna be it. And, um, but what that situation forced me to do was just like that Thich Nhat Hanh quote, is I sat there and gave my full attention because I decided, well, if, my, if I'm about to lose my best friend, I didn't want to blink. I was there 12 hours a day, every day. We were, we were taking turns doing shifts, sitting with him so that one of us was always there. And I, I, anything that he needed, I did it, just without question. I was going to do it. I was going to do it the best I could. I was searching my, my mind and my heart, trying to find what can I do to help him, even if it's just to make him a little bit more comfortable or just to ease his suffering even just a little bit. And um, miraculously, he ended up pulling out of it because that's what kind of person that he was. Um, he literally, almost a month in the ICU, pulled out of it and uh, rolled out of the ICU in his chair and went on to live until this past September, in which after a long bout with cancer, um, me and his partner and his other very good friend went through a similar situation at University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. And we, again, were taking turns sitting with him uh, in the ICU, and uh, his body was failing after trying chemo and then a very, very invasive surgery that was kind of a Hail Mary last ditch uh, attempt to uh, buy him some more time, and uh, it, it didn't work. And we went through it again, and, uh, and then he, he passed away. And I share those stories because uh, if it's, it's an analogy for me in that if this is worst case scenario for the planet and if humans literally are on the way out and we know that we're in the sixth mass extinction, we're losing between 150 and 250 species every single day and it looks very, very bleak. Despite how bad it is and how all the odds feel like they're stacked against us, um, do 
you know, as it was the situation when I was with Dwayne, um, I wasn't just going to get up and leave there, or I wasn't going to just say, oh, well, I'm not going to show up. What's the point anyway? You know, here's this person that I deeply loved and cared about, and nothing was going to stop me from showing up and doing everything I could to help him, even if it was just something as small as just bringing him a little bit more comfort. Um, I mean, at one point uh, in September, just a couple days before he died, literally he was just asking me to rub his back and his, his shoulders because he was really, really tight and sore because he was having to wear this breathing mask. And I was so grateful just to have that to do. And I feel like that is possibly where we are on the planet now, where even if humans don't make it through this, um, I feel like we owe it to the planet, to all the other species, to all living things, to show up and do absolutely everything we can. Um, damn the odds. Damn how bleak it looks. It doesn't matter. In fact, when it comes to that place of really, are we going to love this place properly? Or do we love ourselves enough to give that and share that with the things that we really care about in our lives, whether it's the other people in our lives or if it's trying to protect a certain patch of forest or a coral reef in the ocean, whatever it is that we feel really, really drawn to love and try to protect, I feel like we're at that moment now where uh, we have to step up to that task like we never have before. So, you know, on the one sense, it's, it'd be very easy to take this information in and feel depressed and despondent and throw our hands up and say, well, what's the point anyway? But if we just reframe it, uh, as I just tried to do, it's an opportunity where it really brings, this crisis brings the preciousness of life, I think, into a focus that wasn't there before we were this aware of the crisis, which is how, how precious life is and how amazing the opportunity is that we get to try to have to uh, protect it, to relish it, to savor it, and, and be with it while we're here now. Um, another quote that I have in my book that really helped kind of encapsulate what I was just trying to say comes from Czech dissident writer and statesman Vaclav Havel who said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing, no matter how it turns out. So it comes down to, again, how do we choose to be during this time? How do we choose to comport ourselves during this time? Another way to put it came from Stephen Jenkinson, who shared another analogy. He says, no matter how old you are right now, and our ages vary, those in this room and those watching from afar, however old you are, when we're on our deathbeds, what if a young person comes up to us and asks, in, in 2020, did you know what was happening to Earth? And of course, all of us will have to say, yes. And then they would inevitably ask the next question when we answered yes, so what did you do? So what did you do? And so if I leave you with anything to take home with to ponder after this talk, it's, it's that question. So looking back at this moment in your life from the future, what did you do? What will you be able to tell younger generations that you did during this time? When we knew it was happening, we knew the gravity of the crisis, what am I going to do? And for that, I believe that we each need to listen very, very closely to our hearts in order to discern specifically what I am being called on to do to serve the earth and her people. And so for me, it's, I, I was called to write this book and go, you know, have opportunities like this to talk to people and share this information in service to the earth. And when I took that task on, it has literally completely changed my life. It's brought people into my life that I didn't know before. Um, it's brought another book project into my life that I'm uh, about to start working on with a Native American elder. Uh, it's, it's completely changed my perceptions of what's happening and it's deepened my life 
And it's also brought challenges like how do you deal with information like this with what's happened to the planet. Um, but my point is, if, if I've had that experience, I have deep trust and faith that anyone in here that takes on a cause or, or just, you know, really up the volume on the cause that you're already working on and, and the effort and the commitment that you too will have similar results uh, and it will impact your life similarly. And so then the final question that I'll end with and uh, leave you to take away and think about is to what are you going to give your attention, your fullest attention to during these times as we go forward? And thanks everyone very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we have plenty of time for questions or comments. Yes, ma'am. Oh, just a second. There's going to be a mic coming to you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there ways that you and anyone and everyone else in this room have where you may know a teacher, a principal, a professor, anywhere from grade school on up to the graduate school level, where we could develop a program with your book and with the people who have been participating in this conference and make it really urgent. Um, the, the curriculum is already here. You have book, we have many books from, from people who've been here. And it will just take somebody to, uh, who, to organize that. Um, we've already seen what young people can do um, with, with the gun, gun lobbies and, and Greta Thunberg. Um, do you know of anyone? Does anybody in this room know of somebody who could start to put that together? I personally don't, but that'd be something for folks to think about. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Respond to your uh, question. So uh, my name is Portia. I'm actually with the Suffolk County Executive's Office. Um, and I'm actually here because we're actually hosting our first annual Youth Climate Summit this year. Um, so it's not formally announced, uh, but my coworker here, Bridget, and I came to see what kind of resources were, were present here and you know, really came to listen to you, which amazing talk. And it's something that I do feel that we need to be more urgent about. Um, I'm a millennial, and uh, there's a lot of us and a lot of Gen Zers that do uh, have cl uh, climate grief that a lot of our parents don't understand um, because it's, it's a, this new term. And, but it's not a new phenomenon. I think it's just really coming to the surface because it's in our faces now. Um, so that is something that we are looking to do and we have schools currently creating um, a curriculum for the uh, summit. So there are high schoolers at the head of creating the curriculum. But this event is a place where, like I said, we're here to gather resources and see how can we incorporate these teachings and lessons and books. So just hopefully that answered a little bit of your question and concern. Thank you. And thank you for your work. Thank you. About 10 years ago, I was in a transition town meeting, and I asked people, what do we do with the grief? I've been an environmental health advocate for 35 years, and we worked in Westchester County, New York, to prevent the 26-inch frac gas diameter frac gas pipeline from being increased to 42-inch within 100 feet of the critical structures of the nuclear power plant. We had a nuclear engineer of 45 years and the top gas pipeline expert in the country telling them not to do it. We did direct action, we had court cases, and we failed. And for three years, I felt like I got punched in the stomach. Um, someone told me the name Joanna Macy, and she has her book online. I think it's coming back to life. She's 90 years old. But all her exercises in dealing with grief are in that new book with the green cover. I'll be here all week. I can find the title of it if you're interested. And she said, 
I'm not training people. You can just use the book and take those exercises out. One thing I feel as a gray hair is that I think we do need to share information with children, but I like Zoe Wiles' word solutionary, that we have to come up with some projects or something also that we can do. And I recently, a few months ago, met Lynn, I think it's with an E at the end, Lynn Cherry, like the fruit. And I'll also find the email I have with her newsletter. She's now, um, she recently did an event at Omega. She's um, teaching at New Pulse in New York. And on her website, I can't tell you how this has touched me. She has six minute videos of children who've made huge differences. There's a 13 year old from Bridgeport, Connecticut who had asthma, African American, and she actually showed photos of African American communities with incinerators, coal plants, nuclear power plants, and then other photos of well, you know, beautiful areas with none of that pollution, so environmental justice. But with her mom and other people, they got one of the plants in Bridgeport to close. That's six minutes. There's a German boy, another adolescent or teen, who is helping to plant a million trees. And there's um, girls in Florida in their school who did an energy audit, and you actually see the janitor turning off the air conditioning. There are many other films, and my girlfriend, uh, Lori Seaman, who has Strawtown Art Studio in Rockland County, New York, she takes children out to the waterways, and they ask, could we swim in this? And then they do, she helped to prevent against United Water, um, the desalination plant from being built on the Hudson, which would have taken water uh, three and a half miles south of the nuclear plant, and the tritium can't be filtered out, it would have been sensitive. But she helped with Rockland Water Coalition to prevent that, and she's working with children. So I'm here all week. I'm glad to engage in conversations, and I'm thankful to you for initiating this and to the two of you for what you're doing. Yeah, Joanna Macy's amazing, and she's saved my backside more than once doing that work. I second that recommendation of Joanna Macy and, and her work, and she's alive and well and still doing the work, and, but has the literature out there. And, and yeah, the grief, the climate grief is a very, very real thing. And, and if, if, if I find if I don't deal with it or, you know, pretend like, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm fine, I can just go about my life without you know, my little regime of meditation and time in nature on a regular basis and other things that uh, I, I slip rapidly back into it. And then as Greta Thunberg has said, um, action is the antidote to despair. And, and that is an imperative too, but, but not without also dealing with the grief. Um, well, hi, my name is Bridget. I'm here with Portia. Um, and first, I just wanna really thank you for talking about climate grief from your experience in the field from, you know, like the scientific journalist perspective, um, healing from continual trauma that we have from dealing with these existential crises. Um, it's great to see it coming more into mainstream type stuff instead of, um, you know, like the small places that it's been in overall climate movements. Um, I'm really interested to ask you about, um, with your time in the Amazon rainforest deep in it, what kind of interactions did you have with the indigenous tribes that, um, you know, especially like now with Bolsonaro, but um, maybe you weren't there, but um, you know, that how they're being treated, but also the devastation that they're experiencing from the wildfires? Yeah, unfortunately, when I was in the Amazon, that wasn't part of our itinerary. I had almost no interaction of substance with uh, uh, indigenous folks there. I. I I did, in two other areas of my book, uh, one whole chapter on St. Paul Island and the Pribilofs, spend time with the Aleutian people there just to show, I devoted the whole chapter to show how indigenous people around the world, certainly in the Amazon, acutely now because of the fires in Bolsonaro, um, are, as usual, uh, indigenous people, people of color, et cetera, on the front lines, taking it the first and the hardest on the chin. 
um, as always, and, of and uh, simultaneously having the least to do with causing the crisis in the first place. I laugh because otherwise I would rage. Um, but I, uh, so I have a chapter just on how, what's happened to the Aleutian people, and then again up in Utkiagvik, the town in northern Alaska, formerly known as Barrow, um, with the Inupiat up there for the same reasons. But yeah, that's um, what's most distressing to me about how indigenous people are being impacted and then overtly targeted by the Bolsonaro government without question is that is by design because these are and have been the long-term stewards of the land. Literally, there's, I saw an article today in The Guardian of um, some Aboriginal folks in Australia saying, look, if you people would just let us be stewards of the land, you wouldn't have fires like this even amidst the climate crisis. And, and I'm seeing that all over the place now, and this is why, one of the reasons why my next book project, uh, which I'm gonna co-author with a Native American elder, is going around uh, interviewing different indigenous folks about their response to the crisis. Because uh, they're basically saying, look, we, we've, uh, hey folks, settler colonialists, we've been doing this for millennia, uh, clearly the last 400 years shows you don't quite know how to do this. Maybe you should let us take the lead again. Oh, the timeline for the book. It's, it's, we're barely starting, so it's going to be a little bit. But we'll go as quick as we can. Thanks a lot for your comment. Yeah. And thanks for being here. Anybody else? Well, thanks for showing up first thing in the morning for this nice light information. <laughs> um, Go have some more coffee. <laughs> I'll just add here, I'm sorry to interrupt the clapping, Joanna Macy's book is coming back to life, and Lynn Cherry, it's Young Voices for the Planet. All right, well, thanks everybody very much for coming. <clears throat>